I just got this awesome laptop computer. It is the eight core chip. Have you guys heard of that yet? The four core, but it's got eight cores. And it's just really awesome screen, 3D interactive screen, really. Well, there goes my idol. So tonight we're gonna talk about Judges 17. So if you'll take a second and open your Bibles. Wow, this, this, is this Waxer's podium? He doesn't seem that tall when I'm in person. Am I short? Oh, no, no, I, I don't care what I, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to be here with you guys. See, so I got to get all my stuff set up. So everybody's going to go to Judges 17. That's in the Old Testament. And while you're getting there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself since you don't know me from anybody except for a couple of you. Hi, Philippe. <laughs> Let's see, who else do I know? All right, and there's my family in the back. Hi, guys. Um, so anyway, I'm a guy, in case that you didn't know that. I'm a guy. And um, my dad is an immigrant from Hungary. He came over in the late, in the mid-50s when the Russians were invading Hungary and Budapest, and uh, he left home and never said goodbye and came to the United States to buy a car. And then he uh, ended up in Pittsburgh and then moved to Southern California where he met my mom, who was an aspiring actress uh, from Arkansas, who was a Methodist minister's daughter that had gone the PK kid way, you know, pastor's kid way. And so she was in Hollywood searching her dreams out, and they I am the oldest of four children, grew up in Southern California, surfed, you know, Santa Ana, Tustin area, Newport Beach is my surf hangout, and um, I ended up going to college after high school, I mean, college after high school for a couple years, and then I went in the Army for a couple years and served as the infantryman for the U.S. Army in Korea. I patrolled the DMZ for a year, and then I got out of there and I went to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is a training ground for the United States Army and I was in track of, charge of a track there. And then I got out of the army and I came home and my brother shared Christ with me. And I'd grown up in the Christian ministry. Obviously my mom, you know, shared Christ with me when I was little. One of my first memories as a person is singing Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, uh, in the sandbox at the Methodist church in our town. So um, anyway, my own path walk, that I went down when I was in the army. I had my little green Gideon's Bible in my hip pocket, and I would open it up. And how many of you guys have ever seen one of those little green, or Gideon's Bible, a little New Testament? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I would read it in the foxhole at nighttime on the DMZ in the wintertime where it snows one time and then the ground stays frozen all winter. And I would sit there and I would read my Bible. And you know what it sounded like? Wah, 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 wah. And so I got out of the army after spending years of alcohol and partying and hanging out and going to school and all that stuff. I got out. My brother shares Christ with me. And I said, you know, I know all about Jesus. And John 3, 16, for God so loved. I knew all this stuff. And um, anyway, he said, it's not knowing about him. It's knowing him. Knowing him. And then he shared this, you know, Lord, Lord. I mean, I think Mike shared it this last week on Sunday, right? Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. And then my brother used that verse on me. So anyway, I said, what do I need to do to go to sleep? Because it was about 3 a.m. He's witnessing to me. And he was in my room, which was now his room, in my bed, which is now his bed, and we were sharing. And he said, come, promise you'll go to church with me this weekend. So I went to church. I gave my life to Christ. I ended up teaching a Bible study uh, for some guys and uh, going through the Bible. We used to read four chapters a day with a friend of mine, uh, Bill Walden, who was a singer for the Mirrors back in the day in Calvary Chapel, and um, ended up going to school uh, there at Calvary Chapel for the pastor's school. Halfway through it, I met my beautiful wife, Kimberly, and she um, believed my snow job and married me. And, um, <clears throat> and then uh, after I got out of seminary or pastor school, we ended up going to Colorado and we planted a church in Durango, Colorado, Calvary Chapel on Bayfield. And uh, at which time I served alongside with a buddy of mine, uh, starting this church from ground up. And uh, so I kind of know where you guys are at with the church growth model, all the pain you go through. And um, then we, I, I said, well, Lord, what do you have going on for me next? And God allowed me to go become a pilot. So I went down and I went to flight school and um, became a pilot. And right now I serve as a pilot uh, in God's Army at Hawaiian Airlines. 
So I get to meet all kinds of neat guys and have really interesting conversations about the speed of light and how God put light in between the stars and red light shift and all the science stuff that we all talk about. Um, so you might get a couple illustrations that are aviator illustrations. For those of you who know anything about aviation, I'll be happy to share those with you. But I've basically been in ministry for about 20 years, plus or minus a couple years, but I've been in ministry for about 20 years, and I'm the father of five. So I just want to introduce my family. They're in the back row back there. So there's my wife, Kimberly. And please. Thank you. <laughs> and then my son, Christian. And he's 17. And then my daughter, Ashley. And uh, she was born in Colorado. He was born in Orange County. And then my daughter, Julia, who was born in Arkansas. And then we have, <laughs> we have two of them that went for the popcorn, I guess. You guys sold them out for the popcorn in the movie. So uh, Colton and Joshua, one was born in Orange County. And Joshua was born here. And his name is Col uh, Joshua Kealoha. So anyway, um, that's what it is. I have, have, have had highs, high highs with God, and I've had low, low, low lows. I'm not going to go into details about my lows right now. Maybe one day between you and I, we can absolutely have that conversation. I'd love to share it with you. But everybody loves a good story. Everybody. I mean, that's why we go to the movies. We'll shell out 10, 15 bucks, seat in 3D, whatever. Everybody loves a good story. And especially like me, I'm a total romantic. I cry at the end of stupid movies. Ask my daughters. I mean, I'm just like, I get up. They laugh at me. Dad, are you really crying? I'm like, no. <laughs> it's a stupid movie. I hate watching this show. This is like my fifth time. And I still cry because I know it's coming, right? I know, yeah. Oh, jeez. So anyway. Everybody loves a good story. And you know what? God's word is so great. It's chock full of great bedtime stories, isn't it? I mean, you guys just finished Samson last week. Isn't that right? So you heard about Samson. You've heard about Othniel. You've heard about all these great judges. Well, tonight in Judges 17, how many of you know that Judges 17 actually takes place before Judges chapter 1? Do you guys know that? Okay, well, I had a timeline that's not going to make it on the screen tonight, but let me give you a little brief uh, geology real quick, geology lesson, geography lesson. There it is. It's really, it's really kind of blurry because the resolution, the, the shot I got. Do you guys have a map in the back of your Bible? Most of you do, and it will be like uh, cities of something in the Old Testament. So, because <clears throat> what we want to do is talk about the places we're at and how do all these things fit into our life? And in order for me to tell you a good story, as if I was a dad telling my uh, children, sitting in the house with a crackling fire, my stone house and the thatched roof, and we've all been out you know, herding sheep all day and gathering the harvest, and we come back to bed, and the only thing to watch is the fire flicker. And you know kids, they're like, Daddy, tell us a story. And so being the good dad that I am, back in the, in young Jerusalem, let's say, in young Israel, I'm going to tell them a story that teaches them a life lesson that's going to help them to succeed with life. That's going to teach them about God's faithfulness. It's going to teach them about God's character. It's going to teach them the do's and the don'ts of life as a, as a successful, godly person. So in order for us to do that, you guys all found your little map and you got your hand in Judges 17. And then Let's close our eyes and pray. Father God, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You're the keeper of history and the author of our futures. Lord, you're sitting exalted on the throne. And you're here with us even right now, Holy Spirit. We are bombarded by this world 24-7 from the day that we're born with corrupted values, with false beliefs, with broken systems, Lord, with errored ideas. <sighs> Forgive us for our sins, because we sin, Lord. Forgive us for our iniquities. And use your word to speak to us tonight. We are your people. We beg you for the words of life. For it's through knowing the true and living God that we have not only your guarantee of abundant lives here,
paradise in perfection. I praise you and I thank you, Father God, in advance for what you're going to do. Please bring everything together for us tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. So let's look at this map real quick. So you can either look at the one on your Bible or in the screen here. I, used, I did have a huge bamboo. You know, you can't buy laser pointers anywhere anymore. They don't sell them at the Circle K anymore. I guess people are shining them in pilots' eyes when they're... Anyways, that's a pilot joke. Okay, um, this area right here, this is the... Well, this is Israel right here. And up here, down here is the Salton Sea. You can probably see that. And up here is really blurry, but it's the Sea of Galilee and the River Jordan and all, all the little oceans in the middle down there. So that's the main, main drag there in the middle. And then you've got the main mountain line right here, down Israel. You see this big mountain line right here? And down here you're going to see, I think this is Jerusalem. I can't read it, but I think this is Jerusalem. And in here we also have Shiloh which is where they set up the tabernacle after they cross the Jordan. So they cross the Jordan over here, and they come in and they take Jericho and then Ai, which is like right over here. And then they set up in Shiloh, God's tabernacle. Um, the land was all divided up by the different tribes. And um, so then you've got all these different places in here, and this whole hillside right here is called uh, the Hills of Mount Ephraim right here, this whole area. It's kind of like Orange County or, you know, that little area, county area. So when you think of like, oh, there's a man of Ephraim who had parents and his name was Samson. This is where Samson was from in this area. Okay? And then there was a man, uh, Caleb, one of the two oldest guys at, when this is written. He's the old, Joshua and Caleb are the oldest guys in all of Jerusalem. They're, or in Juda Judaism at the time, they're 85. And uh, here's Hebron right here, which is the mountain where the Anakim were. And uh, so he went down there and took that. That's his, give me my mountain. You know, you know that phrase? Give me my mountain. And he, 85 years old, he takes it. So that's Caleb's mountain right there. And so you've got all, and uh, Joshua actually retires right up here in this area in Timnath Sarat uh, after he divides the land up. That's where he lives. And let's see, that's about it for now. I think, um, I can't really read that. I know you guys can't either, right? But you have one in your Bible? All right, so, so the Bible tools are really good when you're going through the scriptures because we didn't grow up there to know where these places are. Like, for example, when we go uh, to the movies and they have the little, is that, can you hear the, yeah. Okay, so um, when it says Gotham City, you know what's coming, right? It's a Batman movie. So that's the hero, Batman. Or if it says Metropolis, it's Superman, right? You can, you can say it. It's okay. I like, I like feedback. Um, um, I like feedback in case you didn't notice. I have them. Um, and then, um, let's see, we go, oh, uh, recently, uh, New York City. That's the home of the... Avengers, right, if you've seen the movie just recently, you know it's the Avengers, right? Well, did you say Transformers? I'm a guy, so you gotta talk my language, yeah. That's right, that's right. So anyway, when you, when you say a city in a story, it sets the scene for what's going on. So here it is, Judges 17, and there was a man of Mount Ephraim. So if you were my kids and I said this, they'd be like, ooh, Mount Ephraim, that's where all God's heavy hitters come from. That's where Samson's from. Oh, that's where Joshua, that's where Caleb's. You get this, just what I'm saying? They like, they know something big's coming. And then he says, whose name was Micah. Like, okay, now we know our main character's name. And he says, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, that which you cursed, that I heard you say, cursed be the person who takes those, those shekels. I, uh, <clears throat> I took it. And his mother said, Oh, blessed are you of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his father said, or his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto you. And so he gave the money to his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of the silver and gave them to the founder who made them a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. 
So today's, tonight's study is going to basically cover three characters. And we're going to talk about Micah's mom real quick. Um, so you're going to have to kind of, kind of hang with me. Put your thinking cap on for a second while I share with you a little bit of timeline. Moses was born around 1520. And then he's about 40 years old, and he kills the Egyptian. Remember that? And then he goes, oh, man, somebody found out about it. So he took off to the desert. And he lives in the desert for how long? 40 years, right. He, marries a, he, he meets a pretty girl. He gets married. He thinks his life's over, or life is just going to be mellow. He's out. And then at 40 years in the wilderness, what happens? The burning bush, Moses, right? Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And so Moses goes back to Egypt. About that same time, Joshua is born. His servant, his, his helper, right? Joshua and Caleb are both born right about that same time. And so about 1480, he leaves. Joshua is born. And then uh, about 1470, 1460, Micah, this guy, Micah, his mom is born. His mom is born about 1460. And um, I can tell you this because she's in the promised land. And anyone over 20 years old, when the spies returned, died in the promised land because they did not believe. And so she had to be, let's say 15, 18 years old at that time. And so... Then what happened was, Micah is prop, so she's born in Egypt, and she grows up as a teenager in Egypt. Now, how many of you guys are teenagers? Have been teenagers, everybody. <laughs> that was the wrong question. Okay, remember when you're a teenager, how important your peer group is, how important society is, how important like, the correct kind of little thing you wear in your hair, or the sheet that you wear when you walk down the street, or even the sandals that you're buying. I mean, guys, you want to have the chariot with the spinny hubcaps. That's the only way to get the girls, <laughs> right? So these value systems of Egypt are set and implanted in Micah's mother's life. I mean, she's living there for like 18 years. That's where she's at. And then they leave. I'm sorry. Micah is born while they're in Egypt, most likely. He's probably five or six or ten when they go through the wilderness experience, and he comes out the other end. Um, Joshua and Caleb go and spy out the land. They're about 40 years old. Moses is 80. Um, then God says nobody over 20 is going to enter the land, and so they go through the wilderness for 38 years, and then they do a numbering of everybody in the tribe, and they see that not one person is alive. And at that time, God says, okay, Moses, it's time for you to die. You may not go into the promised land. And so Moses gives his last words, which is actually the words Micah had, that Micah heard Moses speak. Micah's mother heard Moses speak. Micah's house is right down the street from Joshua's house. Joshua is less than 85 years old. The lands haven't been divided yet. Because if you just look at your Bible for a split second into chapter 18, you'll see that the Danites haven't left. They haven't left the, mounts, the mountains of Ephraim yet, where they've been run into the hills by the Amorites, right? So they haven't left yet. So we know, based off of our Old Testament in Joshua, that this is prior to the dividing of the land to all the final tribes. So that's why I tell you that this happens prior to Judges chapter 1 because Judges chapter 1 happens after Joshua dies. Right? Okay, good. We're all together. Excellent. So Joshua and Caleb are 75 when, or 78 when they enter land. And then they're 85 when Joshua divides the land and jo Micah casts the idols of silver prior to that time. And he also starts his own church, his home church, before this time. And he does it through this, these means. So real quickly, um, so now we know his mother was born in Egypt. She was indoctrinated into the worldly system of Egypt. She learned all their value systems. And listen to their value system. The most important things are position, influence, money, education, 
financial stability for a good retirement. Does that sound familiar to you? Isn't that amazing? So that system hasn't changed for a long, long time, has it? So her parents were probably slaves for Pharaoh. They either worked in the bricks or they did something else, washing clothes, whatever. She learned the value system. She served as a slave, most likely, up until her teen years when she left. But she also saw God's power. She saw all the plagues. She walked across the Red Sea's bottom with dry feet. She saw the tree thrown into the water of Meribah, and it was made sweet. She saw the manna come from heaven. She saw the day-old manna turn into worms. She saw her mom and her dad die in the wilderness. She saw the golden calf. She saw Moses grind it up and throw it in the, in the creek, in the brook Kedron. She saw all these things. And in Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 20, I'd like to show you that real quick. She was warned. She was warned. Remember how I told you that she was there listening to Moses? Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 20. This is Moses speaking. All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers and that you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. That was her. He's speaking directly to her to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. Neither did your fathers know that he might make known that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Your raiment, your clothes never got old, and neither did your feet swell. And another verse that says, and your shoes never wore out. Thus you will consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God corrects you or chastens you. Therefore, you will keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God brings you into a good land, a land full of brooks, water, fountains, depths that spring out, all these good things. And then verse 11, skip down with me. Beware, or verse 10, I'm sorry. When you have eaten and are full, then shall the Lord your God bless you for the good land which he has given you. But beware that you do not forget the Lord your God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when you are eaten and full and you've built your houses, dwelt in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your golds multiply, all these things, and your heart is lifted up, do not forget the Lord your God which brought you forth, which led you out of the house of bondage. So, I was sharing with my wife, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about math. Do you remember math? How it's like 2 plus x equals 5. What does x equal? Blank stairs. Yeah, 3 in the back. Thank you very much. Give that man a dollar. All right. All right. That's right. 3. So 2 plus 3 equals 5. So 2 plus x. So there's, there's this going on. God said, if you do these things, then I will bless you. I will keep you. I will give you peace. I will do all these things. And all through Judges, you've seen how the people disobey God's equation and they get, or they disobey, and so they get God's equation. If you obey, I will bless you. If you disobey, you will be judged. Because God keeps his word, doesn't he? God keeps his word all the time. Matter of fact, he puts his word in front of his own name. So that's really powerful to remember. So she had a mixed life. She had gone, she had heard Moses, she picked up a little bit of religion, and then she took out all the idols that Moses warned her not to do, to take with them in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 10. He says, don't, don't go through all these lands and pick up all the idols. But she'd lived a mixed life, and she had taught her son to do the same thing. She taught her son to do the same thing. And now she was reaping what she had sown. She goes, the money that I lost, there it is back here, Judges 17. The money, the 1,100 shekels of silver, I stole them from you. 
so he said, when, when you cursed the person who took the money, I, I was kind of starting to worry. See, he wasn't worried before she cursed whoever took the money. He took the money. He had no problem taking the money. But he started getting worried after he heard her curse the person who stole the money. So we know what kind of guy Micah is. He's one of those superstitious guys. You know, he's probably got a little rabbit's foot in his pocket and lucky underwear and, you know, a little ritual he goes through before he pitches the ball or whatever, right? He's got all kinds of superstitions and he didn't repent until he actually heard a curse because he doesn't have any fear of God. His mom had never taught it to him. So he doesn't have any fear of God. Now he's superstitious. Man, God, I hope you're on my side. You guys hear about the Irish guy looking for a parking spot? Drives in at Walmart. Looks, he goes, Lord, if you help me find a parking spot, I swear, I'll quit drinking for the rest of my life. And somebody backs up and he goes, oh, never mind, Lord, I got one. <laughs> so he has no fear of God. And so, so for Micah, let's look what he does. Micah had a house of God and he made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. That's verse 5. So he has this molten image and a, and a little idol that his mom makes for him. And um, then he also has this whole little house of gods and he has a little, an ephod is a robe, a consecrated robe that he's made. Remember he grew up seeing stuff, all the temple, all the Holy of Holies outside. He grew up in the whole, through the wilderness journey. So he saw all the stuff going on. He saw what things were made and how things went together. He's probably like 10 years old, how impressionable he was. So he sees all this stuff and he goes, I'm going to make myself a house of God because I'm a superstitious guy. So I'm going to try and pad my bets. Right? He's going to pad his bets. So he's got it backed up. And he's got a little house of God. He's got all the little teraphim, which are all like family little idols that they have. And then he has now his molten image from his mom. And he's got this little graven image that his mom made for him. He's got an ephod, a special little consecrated robe. And he says, you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to make my son my priest. This is, this is going to work great. Keeping the family. This is perfect. And so that's exactly what he does. He says, he will be my priest. You know, he did all the stuff because he didn't have the fear of the Lord. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Proverbs 9, 10 through 11. Flip over there real quick with me if you can keep up. We're going to do just a little jaunt here. I feel like I have to stand on my tippy toes to see my Bible here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Verse 11, for by me your days shall be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased. You see, money is actually time converted into something you can trade. You take your time, you make an object, you sell it, you get money back for that time that you invested in it. So money is just a conversion of personal time. And so by Micah stealing his mom's money, he was buying time for himself. He took it. Um, it's 110 years salary. Did I mention that? The 1,100 shekels of silver? Later on, we're going to read the priest. He gets paid 10 shekels a year. So he stole 110 years' salary from his mom. A lot of money. Abraham bought the field that he buried Sarah in for 400 shekels of silver. It was a huge piece of land. So 1,100 shekels of silver is a lot. And Micah doesn't fear God. But you know, we know from Psalm 139, go a little further with me. From, or to the left, I'm sorry. It's to the left, to the left. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. Psalm 139. Wow, Psalm 119 is long. All right, 139. Lord, you've searched me. You've known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand all my thoughts, even from far away. You surround my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, you know it. You have put me, you have beset me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is so wonderful for me. It is so high, I can't even comprehend it. Where shall I go from your spirit? 
or where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. And even if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. So the psalmist David is telling us there is no place to escape God. He sees everything. And the scriptures say that every word we say is written down in a book. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. And you know, God knows that we do that. God knows that we are sinners. God knows those things. That's why Jesus died for us. It's like God wasn't surprised like, like today when you said something you weren't supposed to say. God's not surprised by that. It's accounted for, but he's not surprised by it. He knows that we're broken. That's why we need a Savior. Do you understand that? There's no guilt. There's no guilt for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Now, there is correction, like what we read in Deuteronomy. Like, God loves you as a child of God, as his own son. He's going to correct you. No, son, that's not the way we do things around here. You know, God does love us. And he's going to correct us. And there are consequences for the actions that we do, aren't there? Good and bad. We reap what we sow. Micah's mom is reaping what she sowed. Micah is going to reap what he's sowing into next week. We'll see how that turns out. But God's word here in verse 6 gives us the main point of our text tonight. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which is right in his own eyes. No king. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. Now, Micah is in grave error. Remember when Jesus, the Sadducees came to Jesus and they said, oh, you know, who, uh, this guy marries his wife and then he dies and his brother marries her and then another guy marries her and they're all sleeping together. And so when in the resurrection, whose wife will she be in heaven? And what does Jesus say to them? He says, you don't know, you err greatly because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And that's a real strong key to why everybody's doing what they're doing here. They don't know God's word and they don't know his power. So what's happening is accurate. It's truthful. But it doesn't, it's not saying, here, do like these guys. This is what not to do. This is what not to do. So the kids are hearing this story from, from dad, sitting around the fire, you know, in the house. And they're sitting there going, oh my gosh, what are they going to, oh, they built an idol. Oh, God, oh, don't they know? Don't they know that when Moses came down off the hill, he said, all you men who are with me, gird your swords on. We're going to go kill everybody. And that's what they did. They killed all the Israelites who were worshiping on the other side, partying. Kill them all. Whoever's not with me, we're going to slay them all. And so they do it because God doesn't like us to have a divided heart. He wants us to be totally in love with him, one-on-one -on -one consecrated with him. So they didn't know the power of God. So Micah thinks that through works or through great sacrifices or through <clears throat> a religious garment that he wears, he can achieve right standing before the God of the universe. And he's got a little house dedicated to it. He is making a grave, full of sorrow mistake. They are all doing what's right in their own eyes. I'm going to read to you real quickly Deuteronomy 29. <clears throat> this is Moses. He says, Obey the terms of this covenant so that you will prosper in everything you do. This is the New Living Translation. All of you, tribal leaders, elders, officers, all the men of Israel, you're standing here in the presence of the Lord your God. Your little ones and your wives, they're with you, as well as all of the foreigners here that are chopping wood and carrying water. You are standing here today to enter into a covenant of the Lord your God. The Lord is making this covenant, including the curses. By entering into this covenant today, he will establish you as his people and confirm that he is your God just as he promised you. And he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you're not the only ones 
with whom I am making this covenant and its curses, the Lord says. I am making this covenant both with you who stand here today in the presence of the Lord, way back there in time, and also with the future generations who are not standing here today. That's us. That's us. Then he says, remember how we lived in the land of Egypt, how we traveled through the lands of enemy nations as we left. You have seen their detestable practices, their idols made of wood, stone, silver, and gold. I am making this covenant with you so that none among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe, will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. Those who hear the warnings of this curse should not pat themselves on the back and think, ha, I'm safe even though I'm following the desires of my own stubborn heart. This leads to utter ruin. The Lord will never pardon such people. Instead, his anger and jealousy will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will come down on them, and the Lord will erase their names from under heaven. Now, is that powerful or what? <laughs> Micah's mom heard that. Micah heard that. Joshua served next to that, and he had that heart, and they saw Joshua. They were there fighting seven years, taking the land, and Joshua lived right down the street from Micah. And Micah has a little house of gods in his house, and a little, you know, ephod, and dress my son up like a priest, and start my own religion. And next chapter, we're going to find out that all the neighbors they were all in on it. They're like, yeah, right on, dude. And Shiloh is right just up the hill. That's where God's Shekinah glory is, sitting on top of the Holy of Holies. And Micah is forsaking all of that for this little piece of Egypt, this little system of belief that has nothing in it because he doesn't know the power of God and he doesn't know the scriptures. So, <clears throat> then, there's a special message just for us who want to be in ministry. The priest. Let's look at our priest. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city of Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where are you coming from? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, who, won't you dwell with me and be a father and a priest? And I'll give you 10 shekels of silver every year and, and a suit of clothing and, and food and shelter. And so the Levite said, that sounds pretty good. And so he dwelt with Micah. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And Micah said, Now I know that God is on my side, seeing I have a Levite. Well, sojourning is traveling. It's just looking for a temporary dwelling place. And all of the Levites, they were given 48 cities all through Israel. 48 cities with all the little suburbs around the cities for their cattle, for all their belongings, for everything they have. They were given plenty of shelter and food. Furthermore, they were also given the tithe of Israel. Whatever came in as a tithe was given to the Levites, their food, money, whatever was given was to be theirs. God said, I am your inheritance. You will not have a big piece of property like all the other tribes. I am going to be your inheritance. I am going to be your all in all. And this priest was searching for fulfillment outside of God's presence. 
Didn't God give him 48 cities to go dwell in? And yet he's out searching. And what makes him stop? What makes him stop? I will make you like a father to me. In other words, I am going to listen to you. Let me say it with some flattering words. Man, you are so good looking. Could I, um, would you mind if I made you like a model for a clothing line that I have? And, and I'm just going to put you on every billboard. And, you know, you're just going to work for me. I will totally, I mean, like Beckham, he's gone. You're going to be the new Beckham. Does that make you feel good? Does that make you feel like full of pride? Ah, pride. That's why he left the city. That's why he left the presence of the Lord. Because he wasn't getting fed. The man wasn't being fed what he wanted to hear. And so he has a place now. He had money. He had clothing. He had shelter. He had food. But he was out sojourning to find a place of personal value where he felt like he was valued. Can I tell you guys that God wants us to find our value in him. You know, and if, and if we're growing tired or weary, sometimes, you know, we go through seasons of our life in our, in our relationship with the Lord, and it's kind of like, like I shared before, wah, 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 wah. And it's like, you know, don't give me a scripture. You guys have never been there? I have. I've been there like, dude, there is no scripture right now that's going to make me feel better. I mean, I, like I said, I've been real low. You know, I'm like, I don't want to hang out with you because you're like too happy. I just want someone to come alongside with me and just like cry with me. I want somebody to love on me, to be my friend. I don't need a Bible study. I just need somebody to have lunch with. And so this is um, that fulfillment that we have comes from a relationship with God. And we go through those seasons, those ebbs and flows. And um, I like to think of a life cycle that God has for us. He has, <clears throat> if you think of a circle like a clock, and you put at two o'clock like an opportunity. You know, opportunity is the same symbol for danger, right? Or something like trouble or something. I forgot what it is. Anyway, opportunity. It could be good or bad. And then that drives you into prayer, right? So you go around the, pr the circle. Opportunity brings prayer. And then when God answers your prayer, he answers the prayer and action happens. And then what comes out of that answered prayer is true worship. That's right, true worship. Which is God's, that's what God likes to get paid, is worship. Like real from the heart worship. And we can try to do all these different things, tithing, sacrifice, whatever. But it's really what God wants is us to worship him and to love him so he can love on us. And it goes around and around the circle of life. That's the circle of life. God brings opportunity. We go down on our knees for prayer. God answers our opportunity, our need, and then we worship him. God brings another opportunity. We pray. He answers. We worship. <laughs> round and round the wheels on the bus go till we get to heaven. Okay? And they all change. They get deeper. They get wider. God causes us to grow. Micah was so happy. He had a priest. He had an official mediator with God, which was... Only mediator, Jesus. And now he says, me and God are good. We're all buddies because I got the right guy doing the right job. So, priest side, why am I doing things? Where's my heart at? What am I doing? How, why am I not finding my satisfaction in Christ? Where am I really at? Crazy thing is, like I said, he was living right down the street from Joshua. Caleb was alive down in Hebron. Shiloh's there. And yet here he is living a lie. Moses spoke to him before he died. And he said that there's one coming that you're supposed to listen to. One coming. And about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. And people rejected Jesus because they were worried about what other men thought. He said, Jesus said, here I am. And they said many in the synagogue would not confess him. Even leaders, they wouldn't confess him because they were afraid of what would happen to them in the public. And just like... Micah's mom, Micah and the priests, they rejected God's command and did their own thing. So, Jesus came. He fulfilled God's word because he knew we wouldn't be able to. He told us it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. 
All we have to do is believe. It's God's happy pleasure to give us his kingdom. So, here we are living in the world. Our hearts like gardens. And all that we're exposed to, all that I'm exposed to, it goes into my heart and it produces fruit. Everything in my eyes, everything in my ears, all my actions, all my thoughts, it all impacts who I am and what I produce. So, tonight, you and I, I'm telling you, we're like a garden. We have sin in our life. We have those rocks in our life. And have you ever noticed that as you till land, like gardens typically grow rocks? Like they come up, don't they? If you turn ground over, rocks come up. And you know what God says? I know there's a rock there. You don't have to be guilty about it. You don't have to feel guilty. I know there's a rock there. I bought the land anyway. I like who you are. We don't have to feel guilty about our sin. We can say, Lord God, oh, I sinned. I don't want this in my life. It hinders my walk with you. It's hard to hear your word when I'm in sin. It holds me back from the best of the land. It holds me back from inheriting all the promises that you've given me. And I also know that if I continue in my sin, your word says that you're going to judge me, and I don't want that. Right? Yeah. All right, so if we seek the approval of men instead of the approval of God, if we look for the acceptance of men instead of the acceptance of God, if we accept society's okay of the stuff that we do that's questionable, we're in the same boat as Micah. We're in the same boat as, like, the priest. We're in the same boat as Micah's mom. It's just a different form of the same idolatry. It's just a different form of the same thing. And we're justifying it. I don't know how you guys want, if, you know, you can say, hey, I go to church every Sunday and Wednesday. But I live like hell all the rest of the week. It ain't gonna work, you guys. It ain't going to work. And you're just, like I said, we're deceiving ourselves, you know. And like I said before, I'm just a guy. God lovingly corrects me all the time. He takes me to school every day. Every day. And then I hear my wife say, huh? I say something, and then I, and I'm like, well, Lord, here I go again. I'm going back to school, huh? Yep. <laughs> so... God loves us, and he's proven it by giving us correction. He's put the presence of his word in our life. He's given us handrails on the path of life. Remember how Jesus said, narrow is the path, and few there are. Well, he gave us handrails. He gave us his word to, like, walk like babies. All right, I'm coming to you, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's, like, in front of us going, come on, come on. You can do it. You can do it, baby. I'm coming to you, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And then we look off the side, oh, something's shiny, I really want it. <laughs> Help me, Jesus! <laughs> That's right. And God knows that. And so he's given up his, his word as those barriers. And so if we ignore his word, I don't need the barriers. And then we just say, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm going to close my eyes and just trust God. I'm going to walk. And wow, this feels good to go this path. Look at the shiny object. I'll, I'll be right back. And it's a slippery slope on either side of the path of life. And so, with those things said, the warnings from Micah's mom, Micah, and the life of this priest, it's kind of set us up for next, month, uh, next week's lesson out of 18, which is really going to change the dynamics in Israel for the worse for a long time. And it's something that they're still dealing with today. So let's pray. Lord God, you, um, you are so awesome. Thank you for your word. And um, I praise you and thank you for overcoming my personal weaknesses and uh, glorifying your name and bringing the study for your people. I pray that our hearts would be like gardens and that the seed that gets thrown into our hearts would be carefully picked out sifted over by you and planted deep in a heart that has very few stones and no weeds, no thorns. One that's been turned over by you, Lord. And um, tonight, if 
we just, we just rip our chests open. When people in the Old Testament would repent, they'd rip their clothing if there was something really, really as an expression of how full of grief they were. So Lord, tonight, we know you've heard us. I know you love us, and I, and I know you know everything we think and everything we do behind closed doors. It's not hidden. The whole of heaven sees everything we do. So Lord, like I said, we rip open our hearts like garments to be just naked before you. And we ask for your correction, for your love, for your holiness, for a passion for you, for your promise of eternal life, the life that you've meant us to have, full of joy and fullness. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.